Can y'all do me a favor? Because I love them so much. Would y'all just clap your hands until they hurt for my homie, my friend, my brother, and his amazing wife. I love y'all so much. Come on, come on, come on. Man, he is so, <laughs> he's so genuine. And um, he's preached for us multiple times um, down in South Carolina, and my church love him. Um, they get so excited when he surprised them and come down and preach. And um, he's a true, true, true br brother. Um, just, I guess it was a couple months ago, we got to hang out in uh, the Big Apple. And it um, was so fun. Uh, it was my wife's birthday. And so we went to this concert at Carnegie Hall. And then, um, yeah, man, your pastor big time. I'm telling you, he'd be out here rolling. And then we went to this restaurant. Um, we didn't know that every restaurant in New York becomes a club at night. And so... Um, Let's just say it was a little loud, but God was still glorified. Um, but I just love him so much, and um, I love this church. What about this church, man? Come on. Right? Yeah, I love this church, man. And um, I just, you know, what time is it? I got a little time. I just want God to be God today, and I, I just wish that he had given me um, permission to preach something that I know would work you know, but like, he kept me up to like four this morning after our concert in DC and gave me something specific for somebody here. I'm not gonna say it's for everybody, but it might be for like two of y'all. So that's why I'm here and I'm just gonna release that word and we're gonna pray together and let God do what he does best. Could we for a moment, could you just reach out and um, touch someone near you? If you're a germaphobe, the shoulder, shoulder will work. You know, you don't have to just connect. There's power in connection. And, and would you just um, unselfishly for, for just a second begin praying for the people around you just that God will do something so incredible in their hearts that they'll never recover from it. I believe that the Lord wants to lift you to a new place wants to take you and guide you to a deeper realm of relationship. Father, we love you. Come on, just pray for them. You know, the funny thing about church is sometimes you could be standing next to someone who wants to give up and you will never know it. Someone who's contemplating suicide. Someone who's trying to camouflage their depression with a smile today. Father, I thank you that you're enough to fill every void. So now do what only you can do. Fill this place with your glory. Allow us to encounter you in a new, a breathtaking way. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed. Come flood this place. Feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience glory, your goodness. Let us become your presence, let us experience glory. Lord, we love you. We're excited for your move. You are incredible. You are indescribable, strong, mighty, genius, brilliant, beautiful. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, clap your hands real loud. Give them a good shout. Come on, give them a real good shout. Thank y'all. Give them a real good shout. I can still take a lot more. A lot more would be great. Um, grab your Bibles if you got Bibles. Um, and, and if you don't mind, can we just stand for this part? It just, you know, makes me feel weird when we don't. Um, if you don't have a Bible... You use your app, or you can look on the screen. We're going to read um, Psalm 51. You ready? 
You ready? Not yet? It's like right there in the middle. I hate the pressure of trying to find a scripture and I can't find it in church. And they say turn to Jude. Psalm is easy, just open up in the middle. You ready? Let's read this together. It says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. I love that. And in the hidden part, you will make me know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed O God the God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud all of your righteousness O Lord open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise for you do not desire sacrifice or I, or I will bring it he said, you do not delight in, in burnt, burnt offerings, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Lord, breathe on your word. We're here for you. We love you so much. You're so good to us. Do something new in Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seats. Um, so this very familiar passage was written by the man, the myth, the legend, King David. But it was written at a very low point in his life. And it helps me if you talk back to me. Has anyone in your life ever experienced a low point? This is David. He's in a very low point in his life. And he writes this. It's after he has an affair with a woman named Bathsheba who he saw taking a bath. Has this affair where her, kills her husband. And then he gets called out for it, and he writes Psalms 51. And, and this is where, you know, we see a lot about David's character, even through this whole story. Like, David is a really jacked-up individual. We celebrate him. You know him as a, as a songwriter, a worship leader. He got more hits than Michael Jackson. Um, he does. He wrote, I was glad when they said unto me. He wrote that, not the motherboard. He wrote, um, one thing have I desired. That's him, not Marvin Sapp. Um, he, he, got a, he got a ton of hits. Um, Bless the Lord on my soul. That's him, not Matt Redman. He got a bunch of songs, and we know him as that. But David was much more than that. David was also a murderer. David was an adulterer. David was a cheater. David was a liar. David was a manipulator. David was not really a good guy 100% of the time. And yet, God never identifies him by the things he did. Rather, God identifies him as a man after his own heart. Um, a couple nights ago, the Lord, as I was, don't you hate when this happened? You're falling asleep. You ask God to speak to you, but he always picks times that's convenient for him and necessarily not for you. And... Um, and I was, I was going to sleep. I was like, thank you, Jesus. Great day. Yes, amen. And I'm falling asleep. And he said, he just started speaking to me. And I knew it was him. And I knew I had to get up. And so I started writing it down in my phone. And he told me this. And it's very, you know, felt very random to me. Um, and I felt uh, this was a word that he wanted me to release today. And he told me, he said, many of my children identify themselves as failures. Um, he said, you know, we, and we got church. We know how to do church. We, we, but many of us have made 
you know, Sundays into really just Halloween. We put on our, our mask and, and our costumes and we come for a trick or a treat. And, and it's church instead of coming raw and because religion has taught us to cover ourselves, Adam, and try to hide with fig leaves what's really going on. But the problem with hiding things is that it creates a shell which doesn't grant God access to be able to penetrate the depths of our heart that he knows about anyway. I mean, we can't fool him, right? So the Lord wanted me to just speak on this subject. It's very very candid. It's not catchy. I like catchy things. I like twists and turns, um, but he didn't let me do all that jazzy stuff today. He just told me to speak from this, and I want you to write it down if you take notes. I hope you take notes. You should take notes. If you don't have a notepad, you should take notes on your phone, but you should write this down. This is what I came to speak to you about, and I want you to write this down. I want you to say it over yourself for the rest of your life. Very simple. I am not a failure. I am not a failure. Can you say that back to me? I'm not a failure. I love this about David because David is called a man after God's own heart, and David has a jacked up past, more jacked up than most of us in this room, and yet God does not, watch this, identify him by his history, which tells me that God's perception of me is not based on my actions. It's not based on my failures, but rather based on my response. Maybe this is why when Adam fell, God didn't initially talk about the tree. God talked about Adam missing the walk because God is interested in our fellowship with him. Religion, teach us to make a list of things and you abide by this list and maybe God would approve of you, but that's not the way of God. God told us in John, he said, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, don't abide in a list, abide in me. And when you live in fellowship and in communion with him, he would rid you of the taste of things that you cannot get over yourself. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest attributes of the Holy Spirit that I love is the ability to say, no, I couldn't do that before I got filled with him. And so this is God, and he's teaching us a new way, and he wants his sons and daughters to know that you are not a failure. This is something that the enemy has been speaking over you most of your life, and most of us get in the habit of rehearsing it over ourselves. And we typically identify ourselves as failures when our expectation of ourselves or our expectation of others aren't met. So, for example, a relationship. You poured yourself into it, they walked away. Or a parent, you were never good enough for them. Or a career, you tried your best, you still got a pink slip. Or school, you, you stayed up all night and studying, you still didn't get the grades you wanted. Um, I don't know where, where your, your riff came from. Maybe it was church hurt, you did all this stuff for a church, and they still just kind of used and abused you, and then you just felt. You, and so this is what happens, y'all. Let me help you. Anger stems from bitterness, which stems from a frustration or a disappointment. And it's simply this. It says that you owe me something. I found this from Andy Stanley. I'm not going to act like I wrote it. But he said, he's smarter than I am. He says that anybody who's angry is angry because you are holding someone hostage because they're in debt to you over something. So the only way to become liberated by this anger is through the power of forgiveness. As long as you're expecting someone to pay you for something that they owe you, whether it was your time, your energy, your emotions, your finances, whatever, then they hold the power over your emotions, which is crazy. But through forgiveness, we can free ourselves. But the enemy wants us to believe that because someone did not recognize us, did not appreciate us, did not accept us, did not love us, this makes us a failure. Would you write this down? Improper perspective blocks you. I'm just going to fly through some of the stuff that I felt like the Lord wanted me to share, and then I'm going to pray with you. Cool. Um, improper perspective blocks you. There's an amazing scripture you should, you should know. It's in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. I'm falling in love with this scripture. Um, verse 23 and verse 24. And basically it says, whatever you're going to do, do it unto God, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So now, watch this. The weight of me feeling f being fulfilled, I feeling approved, I feeling accepted, the weight of that is now not cast upon someone, hear me, that can't handle it or can't even afford my harvest. The great thing about the Bible, Pastor, is that it calls God the Lord of the harvest. This is important. So whatever you do, 
I don't really call things for my past abuse. And I hate when people try to classify it as that. I got a friend, and we, we, we was in the church together. Man, I worked my heart out, and I did everything in the church. And I was grossly underpaid and had to eat grits for dinner uh, while the pastor was buying boats. It was just a really bad situation. Um, but I can't believe I just said that out loud. <laughs> still in there. Still in there. I'm just. <laughs> but I had a friend who was in a situation with me, and, and we were reflecting one time uh, recently. And, and he was like, man, you know, every time I look back on that, man, I just can't believe, you know, they did you like that, man. I was messed up and blah, 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 blah. And I stopped. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. First of all, great. Thank you for caring. Thank you. But if I, if you don't hear nothing else that I say today, take this in. If I classify my past as abuse, I limit the return on it. But if I see what I did as seed, then I don't look back on what I overcame as something that had power over me. No, 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 no. I look back on my history and say, God, I thank you that everything I did was not for the people anyway. It wasn't for the pastor. I was doing that unto you, and I told this guy this. I said, man, listen to me right now. I said, if I had to do that all over again, if I had to eat grits for dinner, if I had to go through all that stuff, if I had to get underpaid for seed to be in the ground, to even experience half the harvest I got right now? Boy, I'll do that thing again so fast. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. This is why I said it blocks you in proper perspective. Because as long as you're looking at it through the filter of pain, this is what the enemy wants you to do. Now, what you have done is because your posture is incorrect to receive, you're now standing and blocking the harvest from coming up. So as long as the enemy can keep you bitter, then he can keep your arms like this. I just, I, I need 50 people to holler at me if, if you catch this. So what God is doing in freeing your heart, he's freeing your hands to be able to now receive what the enemy owes you and back pay. What if I told you that the future you're about to walk into, come on, is going to make sense of all the pain and all the hell and all the strife? Because now you're getting an understanding that what, the, come on, Joseph, what the enemy meant for evil. God was God enough to use from, it was seed in the first place. Would you just high five three people and tell them I'm expecting a harvest. I'm expecting a harvest, man. I'm going to quit blocking my own blessings. I'm going to quit blocking my own blessings. It's so funny that the same people who used me in the past now call me for favors. But you're not ready for that if in the phone call you need to let them know. It just got quiet on this side of the building right here. I'm glad you called me. I've been holding this for 10 years. You ain't no good. You're nasty. Your breath stinks. And I'm sick of your face. You're not ready. You're not ready. You're not ready. But you got to be like Joseph. Even when the people call you who tried to destroy you, I feel the Holy Ghost in my kneecap. This is an SWV anointed. I'm getting so weak in my knees. I can't, y'all ain't saying nothing. You got to have a Joseph swag that even when the haters come back, that you don't hold it against him. You say, thank you, man. You made me pray harder. Thank you, man. You made me get in my word. Thank you, man. You made me seek. Thank you helped me to stop relying and depending on man to help get me into my future. You taught me to fix my eyes on the one who really has it all under control. Thank you. Thank you. I needed that. I didn't know how to pray. Thank you. I, need, I didn't know what fasting was like. Thank you. I needed to learn, God, watch this, as Jehovah Jireh. And as long as I was depending on you to pay my bills, come on. As long as I was depending on you to recognize me, I never saw my true value in him. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the proper posture where God says, okay, daughter, okay, son. Now I can trust you with the harvest. Because you won't have to post the harvest on social media. 
Because now your identity, watch this, is not placed in your possessions. It's placed in your position. Improper perspective blocks you. Not only that, improper perspective blinds you. It blinds you. This is what the enemy's been doing. He's been trying to see, get you to see your story the wrong way. See, if you wrote your autobiography, it would be all jacked up because you have the wrong perspective. Right now, the enemy wished to blind you of what God has actually been doing. And this is why he's been ministering to you and telling you, look at yourself. You're a failure. Oh, you should be there by now. You're a failure. You still ain't got it yet. You still ain't graduated yet. You still not married yet. You still don't have kids yet. You still didn't open that business yet. You're a failure. But what you don't understand is that God is so God that Romans 8.28 says that he used all things and worked them together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So this is what the Lord is about to do with you in the next 15 minutes. He's going to start opening your eyes to see that it was him orchestrating the madness. Uh Uh-oh. He's going to take the blinders off because you've been giving credit to the enemy for things that God has been behind the whole time. And you've been calling it your failure. And God's been calling it your setup. Let's just bring it home. Some of you feel like you're a failure because you didn't marry that person. You gave them a part of yourself that you can never get back. It didn't end in marriage, and so now you feel like a failure. That's your reality. Can I tell you the greater reality? God blocked that relationship because he knew you would end up in a crazy house. Who am I talking to? Are in jail for burning his clothes and y'all, y'all quiet now. Can I just talk for one minute? I wish I had two hours with you. I don't. Can I just talk for one minute about the God? We don't, we don't give him this credit enough, Pastor. The God who closed doors. Two nights ago, I was laying in the bed with my wife. She was trying to touch me. I said, listen, baby, God is speaking to me right now. (laughs) That has never happened. (laughs) Ever. (laughs) But God was speaking to me. She wouldn't touch me. I said, baby, listen. Something so powerful happened. We had a concert on this tour in Detroit that folded, and we weren't able to do it, but God rerouted us to Grand Rapids. (laughs) And so we went to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and did this spontaneous free concert um, at, at a friend of mine. And so we go there, and, and God moved, and he did something amazing. And I told my wife, I said, baby, that would have never happened had Detroit happened. And I told her, I said, I wonder how many times in my life have I been disappointed over a closed door, over a closed career, come on, over a closed relationship, over, over a closed major. Some of y'all, God done shifted you. You done spent all your money and time. But when God, help me with this, when God closed the door, it's not out of his, it's not him punishing you. It's not him saying, I'm disappointed in you. It's the sovereignty of God rerouting you. So when he closed the door, that's not a time to cry. You've been crying about stuff that heaven's rejoicing over. The reason heaven is rejoicing is because God's not just the alpha, he's the omega, meaning that your future is his past, meaning that wherever you're headed, he's already been, meaning that when God is watching you, you're just like good times. You are an episode, you are a rerun. He already knows the conclusion. This is what a prophetic word is. It's God telling you what you can anticipate because he already saw it. So nothing you enter in is a surprise to him. You can't throw him a surprise party. He's already been there. God is not a procrastinator. He's a planner. Every part of your, the steps of a good man are ordered. Every part of your life have already been planned. You are a character in his story and in your diary. It's his book that he included you in. And meaning, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> You're not the first one. So everything that he does, he's been doing it for a long time. And he's really good at it. <laughs> And so what God has been doing is orchestrating your life, but you've been giving credit to the devil. You mad because you haven't graduated. You a 10th year senior. <laughs> what if, what if, what if, what if? What if, 
What if, just, just hypothetically, what if it's God who keeps closing the door on that graduation because he don't want you to waste the next 20 years in a career that he never called you to? <laughs> it's, it's when his sovereignty redirects you. Or, or maybe you feel like you're a failure because you, you're, you're raising a child in a single-parent home. You feel like, well, God, I just, this ain't the way I, I pictured it. There's a, there's a guy in the Bible by the name of John the Baptist whose father was a preacher named Zachariah. <laughs> and God did something very interesting, and he just told me to share this with Life Church today. God muted the father. What if? I don't know your story. What if, what if God is allowing you to raise that child? Or what if God allowed you to be raised in a single parent home? Because all he needed from the other person was their DNA, not their dysfunction. You... You really don't even know who up in your house. You're raising a prophet. You might be raising the next president of the United States. You're raising the next billionaire. And God says, the anointing on that life is so heavy that I can't allow some, come on, somebody to impart their dysfunction, their mess, their drug addiction, their porn addiction, their perversion into a seed that my hand is on. God has been sovereignly orchestrating your life but improper perspective blinds you to the goodness of God hit three people and tell them you're not a failure I got to speed up the enemy has been trying to get you to see what you're lacking and miss the revelation of what God's behind David I love this dude David He's one of my favorite Bible characters. The name of first son, David, Jace. I love David because, because David, we get his whole story. We get, we get David's ups and downs. And David had high highs. You know, he, he slayed the giant. He reigned as king for 40 years. He did some amazing things. Um, but he had some low lows. This dude, David, the same David, had a son to rape one of his daughters. The same David who had a hit out for, for his murder from both his mentor and his son. The same David had some low places that he had to survive from, this, just craziness. And now here's David in Psalm 51, the lowest point of his life. This is after he, he submitted a handwritten letter. This is after... He set up his whole situation, um, and, and he thought he was going to get away from it. And now David gets exposed, and, and David's whole life hits a flip. Uh, I know his dad's name is Jesse, but David's acting like he's related to Jesse. Too soon? Too soon? Sorry. Sorry. I had to. Sorry. And now David is standing in the middle of his empire. And God sends a prophetic word <laughs> to change his whole life. Now, the truth is that in reality, God could have omitted, he could have done this, he could have omitted the scandals in David's life. He could have absolutely just let us see the highlights. I mean, come on. And there's some people like that in the Bible. Enoch, we don't read nothing bad about him. He just, uh, he just walked with God and disappeared. Dang. What y'all was talking about? Ruth, there ain't no scandal about Ruth. She was just picking up stuff in the field and got a bow ass. <laughs> but David, David, God shows us the whole story. Why? Why? It shows me something, that God is very interested in your reality and not just your highlight reel. Can I have two minutes on this? Social media is the poison of this generation. It gives us this deadly disease of, I call it the snare to compare. And so now you're, you're, you're sizing up your worth and your life by someone else's filtered moments. This is crazy. It's the same for me. I hate Instagram. Because every Sunday I walk away from church like, whoo, God, move, man. And then I see Michael Todd and Stephen Furtick and... Pastor Vernon Gordon, I'm like, I'm not good enough. 
Right Now, I don't know what your story is. I don't know how it does it for you, but all of us fall into this trap, and, and the enemy ministers to us and tells us, you are a failure. Look at your life. It ain't nothing like theirs. Look at your life. You ain't got this going on. You ain't got that going on. And it looks as if other people's lives are perfect. And so God, he inserts his character into his novel called David and shows us, listen, y'all, life ain't about the highlight reel. Life is about what's really Happening and God is breaking this pursuit of this false place called there. Like that annoying kid in the back. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And we do the same thing for God. Am I there yet? Am I there? You have reserved your joy for a place in the future. Ain't that crazy? When I get married, when I have kids, when my kids get out the house, when I get my dream job. When I retire. You see, you never really get there. And so the battle is finding contentment here and now. Here's the problem with there. As soon as you get there, it becomes here. And now you're searching for another there. So how does my here become enough? My here becomes enough when the cross becomes enough. Because the cross is not just a symbol. It's a letter. So when the T of the cross gets in front of my here, then I receive his sufficiency in my now. And I'm not in pursuit for another place. David. 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 David had high highs and he had low lows. He had to learn how to find a consistent rhythm with God. And many of us feel like failures because we keep relating our lives to the false imagery of others. Can I show you one more thing? I love David because David was ordinary. I mean, the Bible describes him as attractive and strong. Some would say he looked like me. strong. But David was ordinary. This dude showed up to his ordination ceremony smelling like sheep. Imagine that. He was uninvited. He comes and the oil gets poured on him. You know the story because the oil is always reserved for the one that it belongs to. And the oil pours on David and now he's anointed and he's called the next king. But y'all, he was ordinary. And I love how ordinary he is because God wanted me to share this with TLC as, as well. That God wants you to know that he doesn't need you to be fancy to qualify for favor. It is faithfulness that attracts favor. Would you say that with me? Faithfulness attracts favor. You're faithful over few, God will make you ruler over me. And this was David. David was a servant by nature. David served his sheep. He served them well. I mean, he served them so much. The Bible says he beat up a lion and a bear over one sheep. That would have been one dead sheep. I'm telling you that right now. I ain't saving a sheep from a pit bull. This dude fought a lion and a bear over sheep. That's how crazy and driven and passionate he was about his assignment. Not only did he serve sheep, the Bible talks about he served King Saul. King Saul, he, he went and played his guitar for King Saul because King Saul was possessed because King Saul's problem was David's platform. God has anointed and called you to be a solution to a situation. And this gave David access. Not only did he serve King Saul and the sheep, but he even served his brothers. The Bible says, on the greatest day of David's life, when he slayed Goliath, Goliath the giant for others and the door for him, when he slayed Goliath, he got there haven't been working for Uber Eats. Just a normal day. Just a, can you take that? Like, it was a normal, he was serving people, his brothers, who didn't even like him. Isn't that crazy? And he shows up, and I just got to drop this on you, because miracles are found, hear me, in the mundane. You've been waiting for the big, magnificent moments. No, 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 no. Miracles, ask anybody in the Bible, are just found in the mundane places. It was Rebecca just serving at the well. It was Samuel. Samuel was asleep when God found him. Some of y'all sleep too much. Find me here, Jesus. <laughs> Gideon was at the wine press. These people, the widow was just making a cake to die. These people were just doing ordinary things. And this is for that, that single mother or, or, the, or the work at home, the stay-at-home mom that's just like, man, I just feel like my life is just so routine and there's no way I can be blessed here. That's a lie. Or the person who you're an undergrad and you're just like, man, my life, there's no way I can be used here. That's a lie. Or the person, you, you just, you just an usher. You're like, well, I thought by now I'd be singing a solo. Come on, every usher want to sing. Just wave your hand and get delivered. I'm kidding. 
It's just like, my position feels mundane. Those are the places where God finds the people he want to use the most. Ask David. David is in the pasture with sheep, and God finds him there. And now he goes from being a nobody to getting escorted quickly to his destiny. Here's the problem. Now his gifts take him to a place that his character is about to get him kicked out of. This is why. This is why the Lord loves you so much. Can I just talk here for one moment? He loves you so much that he's been slow cooking you. Is Richmond the south or the north? Feels like the north. Uh, where I'm from, <laughs> where I'm from, they got this thing called crop pots. And they'll let that thing seep. If you don't know what seep is, you don't know how to cook. And if you call it collard greens, you can't cook. It's collet. Collet. Collet greens. But you let it just seep. Settle. Why? So that the flavor can get in it. Not only that, but it stays hotter longer. This is why God has been taking his time with you. I don't know who I'm talking to in the back. This is why God has been taking his time slow cooking you. Why? So that when you get there, you'll last. <laughs> Getting there is the easy part. <laughs> Staying there takes character development, and God is more interested in developing you than displaying you. And I, I think, I think, I think, I really believe that we are in a time where heaven and earth is fed up with microwave anointings. That's when you hop for a moment. You get one hit, and now you get lost. Or you get a call on your life, and you get this mega church, and then your marriage flop. It just got quiet on the left side. And so what God has been doing, help me, Holy Ghost. God has been taking his time with you. I need you to hear me prophetically. Because what he's about to do with you, he's about to break the curse. Watch this. That's been lingering over your family. This is where I'm going to wrap up right here. This is it. I'm about to wrap up right here. I'm about to wrap up right here. Let's do me a favor. Punch somebody in the kneecap. Say, you are a curse breaker. I got like, I got literally, I don't know why I wrote so much. I got 35 more points, and I'm, a, I'm just going to stop right here. There's no way I can get done with this. What was I thinking? I can't. Y'all got another service. And pastor told me to get off his stage at a certain time. I'm kidding. Kind of. Psalms 51. Just do me a favor. Hit somebody else. Tell them you're a curse breaker. I already feel the Lord kind of moving. Play some, play some Lord movement music. Tell somebody else, you're a curse breaker. This is why the battle has been so hard. Because you're a curse breaker. Can I show you something? Psalm 51 Verse 5, throw it up for me real quick. Y'all got to see this. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Many theologians believe that David was the result of an affair. This would make sense because the Bible never mentions David's mother. It only talks about his father, Jesse. This would make sense why David is ostracized and left in the back of the field and the rest of his brothers get to come to this service because his, his, his father don't want to offend his mom about the son he had on the side. This would make sense why his brothers hate him when he brings them lunch and they say, go back to your little sheep, man. Get out of here. This totally makes sense of David's story. So now when I'm reading Psalm 51 and I see David in the lowest point of his life, now, I'm not making an excuse for the dude, but I understand, watch this, that he's fighting a generational curse. He has found himself in the shoes of his father. And I can imagine him thinking, this, is my, this must be what it felt like for my dad when 
when he had me from a side chick. I'm at, I'm at this low point, and I don't know how I got here. God, you've been so good to me, but now I feel like a failure because I'm repeating history. The Lord want me to tell you, TLC, the reason the battle has been so hard is because you're breaking the curse. You are, hear me, defeating the thing that your parent was supposed to take care of. And now you inherited some things that you never wanted. And so the battle of perversion has been so tough for you and you never wanted that. You keep, you keep desiring drugs and you don't even know where that desire comes from. You keep, you keep being bound by pornography and alcohol and you don't know where it comes from. And God says the battle is tough, hear me, because you're having to defeat something that should have been killed a long time ago. But can I get good news for you real quick? Solomon had his battles, but Goliath wasn't one of them. God is about to use you to slay the thing that's had power over your whole family tree. Here's what the Lord wants you to know. He's not just going to use you on that family tree. No, 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 no. It's too important. He's about to uproot you and plant a whole new tree so that the devils and the demons, I don't know who I'm preaching to, that you've been having a fight for the past 30 years, the kids that are coming through you, come on, the seed that you are about to deliver into the earth, they're not going to have to fight that same thing no more. No, no. That's why you can't give up. That's why you can't give in. That's why you can't throw in the towel. That's why you got to pick your head up and know who you are. You are a son of the king. You are a, you're not a failure. You're a daughter of the king. And you're about to deal with the thing that's been trying to deal with you. I need 200 people to jump on your feet and lift your hands to the king of kings and give a permission to eradicate, to extract, to destroy. Destroy whatever it is that you were born with that you didn't ask for. His power is enough. His grace is sufficient. Now unto him who is able. Somebody take 30 seconds and lift up a worship in this room. Come on, lift up a worship in this room.